uh, to kind of moderate the panel this evening. Um, I am uh, Yale School of Drama, Yale School of Management 2010, uh, and uh, hi Sam, and the managing director at Westport Country Playhouse for just over a year, just down the road, uh, which is a uh, the only professional producing theater in uh, Fairfield County. And I think what I will do to let our panelists, our guest panelists, introduce themselves is I'd like for you guys, we, we talked a little bit before about uh, the path and that maybe some of you guys might be interested in, in hearing how people got to where they are. Um, these are some pretty successful people. Um, so if you just uh, say, you know, say your name, your position now, and uh, you know, how you got to where you got in you know, the thumbnail sketch, and maybe we can start with Stephanie. Um, I'm Stephanie Ibarra. I'm the, uh, what is my title? Director of Special Artistic Projects at the Public Theater in New York, um, which means I run a couple of artistic programs for the public and do various special artistic projects. Um, and how I got here was a very circuitous um, and seemingly sort of disparate uh, route. I didn't, um, if you look back at my resume, you're sort of like, what? But I started as an actor and then found my way into theater administration by way of, um, I worked in development and marketing, and then I left theater briefly um, altogether because I was terribly disillusioned, and I went and I worked um, for a, a big uh, nonprofit after school um, program in Boston for three years, and I did the operations for that. And then I went to graduate school and finally sort of found my, found my footing by way of artistic producing. Um, so it took me a minute after graduate school to, to land um, at the public, but I've been there for six years now. Hi, I'm Kelvin Dinkins, Jr. I'm the assistant dean and general manager at the Yale School of Drama and Yale Repertory Theater. Uh, I got here also starting as a career in, uh, as an actor and um, got trained in undergrad as a producer and sort of tried to find out what that means, not knowing it was a viable career path, I just thought it was the thing people did. I didn't know that it could be a job or it could be a career you could invest in. So after undergrad, I uh, interned at a commercial producing office in New York um, with the producers of Chicago, uh, the musical, and uh, after that was hired to be an associate general manager at um, Intamont Theater out in Seattle. That theater famously closed um, and was, went through a whole financial collapse, uh, mismanagement, and I figured that I needed to find out how to do this work, really, and, and what I didn't know. Um, so I applied to grad school, um, and I did Columbia's MFA program in theater management and producing, um, and got exposure to both the commercial theater sphere as well as the nonprofit theater, and I kind of was leaning towards nonprofits. Um, so shortly after there, I worked at the Civilians in Brooklyn as a development manager and marketing uh, manager um, and got recruited to go work at Two River Theater in Red Bank, New Jersey, uh, where I was the general manager for about three and a half years um, and got really involved in LORT, uh, which is the League of Resident Theaters, um, an association of 74 theaters across the country who negotiate uh, or our collective bargaining association with the major unions, so Equity and SDC um, and USA. Uh, and so working through Lord, I met Vicki Nolan, who I was the managing director and the deputy dean uh, at YSD, um, and we just have had the opportunity to work together um, over the years. So when this position came uh, became available, uh, I threw my hat in the ring, and that brought, that brought me here. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Megan Fressman. I'm the managing director at William Mammoth Theater Company in DC. I, uh, if you read my bio, it, uh, I, I think it, it now at least uh, looks like it was a somewhat intentional path to where I am right now, but I would, um, I usually like sharing, especially when panels like this, that it was, it was absolutely not um, as strategic as it might appear. Um, I was a theater major undergrad at a program that uh, it similarly focused on kind of artistic classwork and didn't talk a lot about uh, pr uh, other functions, so I produced uh, like all the student clubs, but I didn't um, see that as a career path in front of me, and we didn't really have a, a lot of experience or a lot of connections with professional theater, so the internship uh, kind of route post-undergrad was not something that was immediately clear to me. But I liked school, and school, uh, school made sense, so I uh, went to Northwestern uh, for a, which I don't know is in my bio, don't tell them, uh, um, for a master's degree. I went to a one-year master's program at Northwestern in um, theater arts where I was still exploring uh, performance because I also started as an actor. 
uh, and uh, directing and uh, uh, teaching. I did a lot of uh, theater education and creative drama type program there, and I was a production manager for them. So through that, I met a couple of other colleagues, and I started a children's theater company in Chicago, where I was the managing director, but also performed on some of the touring shows for a few years, uh, and discovered I really liked this professional track of producing, and thought I wanted to go to, um, to learn more about it, because again, school was something that always made sense to me. So I was looking at local programs in Chicago, mostly in business administration, nonprofit business stuff. There was uh, some, it was the early years of a theater producing program at DePaul, and Carnegie Mellon had a, a master's in arts management. So I was looking at all of those. Um, and a good friend of mine who ended up going to the Brown directing program um, convinced me to apply to Yale, which I had not been considering because it was like a, this, a you know, back across, I'm from the East Coast, but it was like back across the country in a three-year program, which sounded super long at that point in where I was like 26, and like, that's forever. Um, and I, I don't need three whole years of graduate school. I just need a little bit of kind of like honing of the stuff that I'm doing in order to be a better managing director. Um, but I was convinced because my GRE scores were expiring and it was the same application as DePaul. So I did fine replace on my essay for DePaul and Yale um, and did it badly, uh, which is it was the <laughs> DePaul, we replied, we were in the DePaul finalist group together, weren't we? Yeah. Um, it was the DePaul Theater Leadership Program. No, Arts Leadership, Arts program, leadership program and the Yale Theater with Management the Program. Uh, with Chicago Shake. Uh, Chicago yeah. Shake. So my essay to Yale said I'm really interested in the Yale Theater Leadership Program, which is not at all what it's called. Wrong program. Uh, wrong program. I still got an interview, so thank you, Yale. And uh, <laughs> no one ever called me on it. I was so embarrassed. When I figured that out. Um, and I, once I learned more about the program here, felt like it was actually what I'd been looking for and hadn't been realizing that the, the program, which was this mix of professional practice and continued education, was something I was interested in. While I was here, I applied for and, and um, joined the SOM program, so I did the four-year joint degree, so apparently many years in school was no longer terrifying to me. And then after that, um, uh, applied for a, uh, at that point it was a grant through the Theater Communications Group, which is the Arts Advocacy National Organization based out of New York. They do some great leadership grant programs. At the time it was called um, the New Generations Program uh, for Future Leaders, and they would place uh, artistic management production type folks in long-term sit-downs with various companies you'd apply together, and it was a, at that time an 18-month program where TCG would, if you if you got the grant, would pay for your job at the theater company. Um, and I, we got a, after I finished Yale, waited a few months to find out, but I got the they created the managing director job for me at, at Berkeley Rep in California. At which point I realized for the for the first time, oh, I have to move to California now. Um, which was, like it was just one of those like I really want this job, but I had not really been thinking about some of the like it was just following the like life and career track um, uh, process. Had a great time for a couple of years in California and got really involved in the new play production um, process there. Uh, took a job in development in New York because I really wanted to, to get this managing director job and I'd been up for several gigs while I was in Berkeley and the feedback I kept getting was I had really strong general management background but not the fundraising, demonstrated fundraising um, background that I needed but uh, talked my way into a director of development job for a major New York theater because what they were looking for at the time was somebody who was involved with board work and strategic planning, which were two aspects I had done at Berkeley Rep, and, it, and the, like the fundraising stuff the team could do, so it was the right place, right time job in New York. Spent a couple of years there, and then the Woolly Mammoth job opened up, and it was one of those really great combinations of uh, the right size organization for, for where I had experience, and a company that had a really strong overlapping value and artistic sensibility to what I've done. It's the kind of major new play, new, new work development, uh, avant-garde company in DC. So it was a really great fit. And this is the beginning of my, we're halfway through, I guess now, my fourth season there. Great. Hello. Uh, my name is Preston Whiteway. I'm the executive director of the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center up the road in uh, Waterford, New London, Connecticut. Um, the O'Neill, as many of you may know, it uh, exists solely to discover and launch new work and new artists for the stage across many programs, <laughs> just about every discipline of theater, which is fun and exciting, keeps the days interesting. Um, I'm a bit of a unicorn here because I did not go to Yale, and I've been at the same job since undergrad, uh, which has never was never my intent, uh, looking back on it when I was coming into the job, but... Um, the job keeps growing in interesting ways, and the organization does as well. Um, 
So how I got here, I was an econ major at Duke undergrad and thinking I would go into Wall Street or uh, the UN or something and I uh, was doing theater on the side just to have fun and keep myself sane from statistics classes and uh, had an epiphany about halfway through school of, I mean, acting is fun and I enjoyed it, but uh, what if I combined my interests and started producing and doing the business side of theater? So I did, I did a couple student run uh, student shows there and then Duke also offered students the opportunity to run what they called uh, Broadway at Duke, which was the national tour, which is the organization that brought in the national tours with bus and truck tours to campus. And so uh, I got that and learned a lot about uh, contract management and uh, subscription campaigns and everything involved. Loved it, did an internship between junior and senior year in DC at Arena Stage with the executive director there. Uh, everybody loves everybody. Uh, and it was great. They were getting ready. They were in the process of um, launching their major, major campaign to rebuild the theater. So learned a lot about government uh, lobbying at that point. Uh, and then graduated Duke when all my econ compatriots had jobs and uh, you know getting offers the summer before and their Wall Street gigs. And I did not in April of senior year. Uh, but took this great class with um, a professor called Manny Eisenberg, who would fly down once a week to teach. And he was he is a Broadway producer, produced all of you know Simon's work on on Broadway. Uh, anyway, so he knew that the O'Neill at the time needed a GM and was looking for somebody, a general manager, uh, and had uh, no money to pay somebody with a resume. Um, and the organization was circling the drain financially. Uh, so I interviewed as a 22-year-old graduate and uh, got the job as GM. And the summer season, which is you know our uh, busiest, started a week later. And so it was just sort of jumping in and uh, into the deep end and uh, learning on the fly. Um, about two and a half years into the job, um, the executive director at the time, who I learned a lot about fundraising from, uh, pa passed away and recommended that I be promoted to the board. And so that's what has happened, and I've been there ever since. All right. Uh, briefly, because I'm not going to be doing a lot of talking, but I will say, um, I uh, was a Japanese language and theater arts major at Carleton College in southern Minnesota. Um, I moved to Chicago to be an improviser playwright. Uh, I discovered that I uh, was really, I ended up being really good at independent producing. I got an internship with the Goodman. Um, uh, I then got a job in marketing at Court Theatre on the South Side, came to Yale for, uh, uh, for graduate school. Um, I met my wife at Yale, uh, she's a costume designer, and she had moved out to Los Angeles <coughs> to uh, do TV and film, and it was the recession, I didn't have a job, so I moved out to marry her, uh, and I ended up getting a job, which was nice. Uh, I managed a small theater company for a short period of time, was the general manager of Lagoon Playhouse, before I came to uh, Marin Theatre Company uh, for several years up in Marin County, north of San Francisco. Um, and then again for the last uh, year I've been at Westport Country Playhouse. I have uh, a very uh, sort of straight line, boring kind of path. Um, I don't, it's not, it's not, as, not as interesting as these guys, which is why they should talk more. But before we do that, um, just so we know who you guys are, yeah. um, which could inform what we talk about. So who here is a freshman? The one. Good for you. Fantastic. Awesome. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Like we're at Occupy Wall Street. Um, uh, who's a sophomore? Okay, a couple more. Um, juniors? Just the one. Hello. And I'm guessing seniors with the balance. Maybe. Graduate students? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Um, uh, SOM? Okay. Drama? Great. Who else? Who have I missed? Forestry? <laughs> <laughs> I live in Hope. You never <laughs> Okay, so, so I think there's probably going to be some, var some variable uh, sort of baseline knowledge. So I will go ahead and do this next little part because we talked about, we wanted to fill some of that gap, some of sure. those gaps in. So maybe Megan, could you just sort of talk about the way a nonprofit regional theater is structured? Yeah. Uh, in brief. In brief. <laughs> You know me so well. Just sort of organizationally, uh, jobs that exist, you sure. know, things that people do. Um, so, nonprofit regional theater um, uh, are uh, organizations that are 
uh, I'm going to talk about the most typical, and there are uh, as many different versions as there are companies, but there are some, there are some common threads. Um, most nonprofit regional theaters are co-run by an artistic and a managing director. Some places they're called executive directors instead of managing directors. There's not, uh, at least from my point of view, a substantive difference in the managing versus executive director uh, job execution. That's just trends that exist in different cities, like New York and some places in Chicago use ED instead of MD. Um, the, uh, uh, those two individuals typically co-report to the board. Uh, in some cases, uh, the artistic director is the sole report to the board. In some cases, there's a producing artistic director, but I feel like the most common thing is, is two equal parties both reporting to a uh, board of directors, which at most sizable, so uh, two, two, three million dollar operating budget up through 50 um, plus million dollars a year. That board is, is typically at minimum 30 people, 25 to 30 people, once you're, once you're at kind of a regular operating structure. The administrative staff, uh, which are usually the full year, full-time staff, um, are, are there individuals in a marketing department, a fundraising slash development department. Um, there are some artistic staff that are full-time, full year, who often work in the literary departments or support the artistic director's work or do additional producing stuff. Uh, there are some full-time, uh, full-year production staff members, just depending on the size of your company. It could be anywhere from like one or two people to, you know, 40. Um, sometimes those positions are seasonal, so they come in September through June, um, or they're coming on a project by project basis. Uh, most theater companies with buildings, again, which would be more of the five million and up size, typically it's, it's rare for a smaller company to have their own space, but those spaces also additionally typically have box office staff, front of house staff, um, and facility staff who to some extent are helping run, run the show and the productions during the season and during the year. Uh, all of the artists that we bring in are, are for the most part, show dice show basis. Sometimes people will have resident directors they work with frequently. Willie has a company of artists we work with frequently, but they're not part of the regular payroll, so they're paid by the production that they work on. Um, and uh, actors are technically employees. The other folks are independent contractors, which is a whole other legal HR thing. What am I missing? Any other department? Yeah. Finance and administration are part of the managing director kind of suite. So. Um, so we have, we have those folks as well. Um, executive assistants are the glue that binds everything together. I'm just saying that because my former executive assistant's in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm nothing without her. Um, That's true. <laughs> um, Kelvin, do you, do you have any sort of texture to add uh, if, if you're a producing theater at a university? Okay. Oh, good. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, you are being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> we're unique in, in, in our structure, um, whereas most uh, nonprofit regional theaters operate independently. We work under Yale University, um, and the Yale School of Drama um, essentially has a rep professional repertory theater company. Um, so, in the aspects of our producing, we do producing for graduate students as part of their uh, practice. Um, and they go through a tip what would be a typical uh, show structure, and they you know pitch I think a lot of their thesis productions or uh, independently in the Y Yale School Drama Cabaret, uh, the Cab, um, they have those opportunities as well. But we also maintain a professional regional theater, which does have a traditional model in that you know there are five or six shows a season. Typically, um, we bring in outside directors, um, uh, professional directors working in the field and our students have the opportunities to engage in practice with working professionals um, in that respect. Um, and sometimes they are also on stage, but also for the majority working in the production offices and helping to build these sets and, um, and to do dramaturgy and to help with design. And, and so there's that overlap of professional practice. You know, they sort of say that, you know, that YSD and YRT are sort of like a teaching hospital um, relationship. And Stephanie, I mean, the public is its own unique leviathan, right? <laughs> so it's a great big thing. Um, but maybe could you speak to, uh, you, you mentioned artistic producing and how, how, you, how that's different from maybe other work that happens in, in the artistic uh, production process, or the artistic uh, departments. Sure. Or really anything. Or really anything. Or really anything. Well, um, at the public theater, because we're, we're so big, we're, we are up to, oh. I mean, so big. For, for a theater um, at $44 million a year um, uh, is our operating budget. And we're operating year-round in seven spaces. 
um, which includes Joe's Pub, which is doing three shows a night, 365 days a year. Um, so there's a lot of activity, and so I just want to like call out that the the artistic staff alone at the public theater is is larger than some like full staff of, of theater departments. The senior artistic staff alone, I was just counting in my head, is nine people. Um, so that's the program directors, of which I am one. The um, the casting directors and and um, Susan Laurie Parks um, as our <laughs> um, So we're in good company. But but uh, the artistic producing function is let's see if I can let's see if I can like describe this. The function exists in every theater. Sometime and that that is sort of where the art meets the operations and the business. That's how I think about it. Right at that nexus, that's where artis artistic producing lives. So artistic producers like myself are typically toggling be between the artistic and the sort of business, which is a super, just to be really clear too, false separate, it's a, it's a false separation that we all play into. So there it is. But. Mm -hmm. um, but then, so then there, what that does is create space for those of us who love to play in both worlds to just flip-flop. And um, at a place like the public, um, the artistic producing function typically is, is um, manifested by way of the program directors. So we're each running an artistic program of the public, which in effect makes us like um, mini artistic directors. We're all reporting up to Oscar Eustace, the artistic director, but but we're sort of setting big picture sort of strategy and artistic decisions, and then running the shows from there. Um, in a in a regional theater, the um, artistic producing function um, often lives with somebody who's called an associate producer or uh, an associate artistic director. So they would be the ones who, on a day to day basis might be if the artistic director is away directing or you know having external meetings or what have you the uh, the artistic producing function is often the ones they're operationalizing the art they're making sure that um, everybody is is sort of well informed on on the administrative side the financial folks the marketing folks etc they're helping to craft grant language I mean you name it um, and also, they're in casting sessions. They're help. They're like the uh, production dramaturgs, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how. And and like I said, at the public, that involves a curatorial a a component too. Um, but generally speaking, that's that's what the function does. And generally speaking, you can find it at every theater. It just it just has a different name. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, we didn't say already. These organizations are. Um, sort of created in service of a mission um, and in the service of the greater good to their communities as well. I like that you put greater good in air quotes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was quoting you. Uh, <laughs> Preston, yes, you're, you're a unicorn in many respects, yes. but you, know, you run a uh, new play development and uh, in some aspects a, a service organization for the field. Yep. And can you talk about the structure of that and how that, how that plays out? Absolutely. Uh, no one in American theater has the O'Neill structure. It's um, a little bizarre, but it works well for us. Uh, how it works. Um, I oversee the organization as sole leader, as executive director, also unusual in American theater. Uh, and then there are six artistic directors who uh, lead each of our artistic programs, which are the National Playwrights Conference, National Music th Musical Program, the Puppetry Program, the Critics Journalism Program, Cabaret, and the National Theater Institute, our school, undergraduate school. So each of those artistic directors uh, are in charge of the programs. I'm giving them as much agency to run and make choices as uh, I can. Uh, ultimately, I try to herd the cats all in one direction uh, and provide overall strategic direction for the institution, uh, represent it nationally, internationally. We have major collaborations with, uh, with the Moscow Art Theater and schools in London uh, and around the world. To your point about serving the field, yes, so we're not doing a season, a nine-month season or 12-month season of shows for a, uh, an audience that's in a 50-mile radius. We instead are presenting our professional new work um, in the summer, increasingly year-round as well, but uh, primarily in the summer where we're developing eight new plays, three new musicals, as well as puppetry and cabaret. Mm -hmm. And those pieces, while in front of an audience, are stage reading style, 
uh, and the work then is often going on. The whole point of the O'Neill is to discover a writer. Often somebody is brought to the field's attention by being selected through our open submission process. I promise I'm getting back. The, uh, the O'Neill is really the only place in the country that, well, uh, of size that um, accepts submissions uh, blind, uh, over the transom. You don't have to have a literary agent to submit. So we just got 1,450 plays uh, last month, and we'll select down to eight by summer. We got 285 musicals. We'll select down to three. Uh, but oftentimes, by doing so, we're able to discover undiscovered talent. Uh, so the work that's coming through the O'Neill is ultimately the goal is that to get it uh, out into the field to New York, to London, to Chicago, all across the country. And um, we're We've, we sort of pioneered the idea of play development in the first place, so we're reasonably well known in the field to have um, uh, you know, artistic directors, literary managers from around the country come in to see the work. And so that's how it's done. Great. Yeah. And I am contractually obligated to say that I am an NTI alum, National Theater Student Alum. And we Thank actually had in my class uh, a man named uh, Ambjorn Elder, who was a Yale University uh, student. So it is, I know it is possible for you undergrads to find your way into that program, and if you're looking for conservatory-style training, while still being obviously uh, it's a semester of yeah, yeah, semester away. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's well worth investigating. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, so, uh, just sort of taking a little jag, um, you know, obviously you're here because it's a careers panel, and I thought we might talk a little bit about, you know, everyone here has hired people, um, everyone here has been hired certainly, uh, and thinking about the sorts of skills that you're looking for and the sorts of experience you're looking for um, when you hire. And I'll plant a little seed that maybe we also want to, at this point, talk a little bit about internships mm. and uh, what's good about them, which ones might be better than other ones, what they mean. Um, and I'm going to throw it to, uh, to Stephanie because I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in terms of skills, um, I think in, the art, in, in terms of artistic offices, it really will depend um, a lot. But I would, all of you, as you go through the next like few years of your, your life and start building your career, you will develop skills. But more than that, you will develop competencies. Um, hard skills being something like, I know Excel. I know how to do Excel. A competency being, I know how to work well in a team. I know how to like work autonomously and how to ask for help when I need it. And, and that piece feels much more valuable in terms of like the way to think about developing one's tool belt. Um, and so in artistic offices, there's um, generally a need for, you know, taste and point of view. It's not good taste or bad taste, it's just your taste and being able to articulate that, and being able to talk about work, um, being able to have relationships with artists that are good, um, and, and then also just this sort of standard kind of show up on time, <laughs> you know, you know under, like understand, read the room, that kind of stuff. So there's not a really high bar to entry for artistic staff members except that the jobs are very few and far between because they, artistic staff tends not to be very big. And they, we, we tend to stay put. We tend to like get one of those jobs and just like hunker down. Um, and um, in terms of internships, I mean, I had one once. Um, it was one summer. And then I got a job. And so I. Um, I have a little bit of a, a, I have a complicated relationship to internships now because at least in New York, we have this sort of heinous practice of people coming out of undergrad and then spending a year or six months interning, um, basically for free. So it's not, it's not a great system and there are many people in the field who are looking to correct that. Um, that's all I should really say at this point. <laughs> I'll, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll push more later, but um, I'll leave it open to anybody. Preston? Sure. Um, yes. Yes to everything Stephanie said about looking for the competencies. Where we understand, especially 
uh, I'm rewinding myself to um, age 21 when I interned in DC. Uh, I didn't know if uh, the whole point of interning with the executive director was to learn. And so the whole point when we are looking to hire interns um, or junior staff, we know that you may not have all of the answers right here, right now, that your early career. That's the whole point, especially at a place like Theonio, um, is we're here to launch careers. So we're looking for folks who can roll with the punches, today, who want to be in the room with each other, be able to read the room. It's going to be long days and fun days, but we're going to have to spend a lot of time with each other. Let's make sure that we can coexist and speak to each other and uh, work on a team well. Uh, we're looking for um, life skills as much as job skills. Yeah. yeah, I just I don't think I had an attitude conducive for internships. It just wasn't in um, <laughs> wasn't something I wanted to do. Um, you know, I said, "What's the difference? What is the difference between me being a paid professional and doing this internship for a hundred bucks a week?" So, you know, exiting college, I said, "You know, my the agreement I made with myself was nothing for free, like no zero dollars. So at least give me a metro card and a hundred bucks, and we can talk." Um, but nothing below, nothing at zero. Um, and then after I did an internship for three months, I was just like, I don't, I don't really want to be here. I've had a paid job in theater before in undergrad. I was like, so if I could be paid to be a leader and to actually do the thing that I want to do, why should I sit here and, and not get the experience and get the education that I really want, which is being a working paid professional? Um, so. I, I stand, you know, by myself in that. Some people are like, oh, you got to do your internship, you got to pay your dues, and I'm just not that person. And when young people seek me out, I say, do not work for free, never again. Um, um, so, in the way I approached it was, you know, I wanted, I wanted an in, and I wanted to learn. But again, I got hired for my first job, and the only thing separating me before I got that job three months ago and then is just time. You know, so I looked at it from that lens and saying that if you really want to go for uh, an internship, do it somewhere where you're getting joy out of it and it doesn't feel like slave labor. Um, it doesn't feel like something that, like, you know, you're, you're sort of getting dumped on. Do it for your connections um, and, and in, a, in a way in. And I met with someone while I was in, interning and I was like, hey, I'm really, you know, it was a Broadway producer and I was like, hey, I really want to get out in the field. And he's like, oh, you're in a good place. I was like, no, I'm not. You know, I, I want more, and so you know, don't be deterred by thinking that you have to stay in because I think they are a structure to be corrected, um, and there are plenty of organizations that are now developing so many greater pr programs that at least give you housing, that at least you know, call it an apprenticeship, something that you can do. And I would say, just in terms of going out and interviewing, the skill that you or the muscle you have to work out is leveraging your narrative. You know, because there, there's nothing preventing you from taking on that position. It's, it's about ability and your capacity uh, to take on a task and do it well. And they won't know it until you've proven it, you know, until you've been there. So leveraging your narrative and what you can do and what, you're, what your aptitudes and your soft skills are um, is essential in that short window of time when you're meeting someone. So that's my advice. Jump, don't, if I may, jump in right back in. Um, and forgive me. Uh, the... <laughs> yep. Uh, the two things. Um, know why you're going in if you want an internship, because Kelvin's absolutely right. It's not right for everybody, and nor should it be. But if you want one, what 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 is your purpose? What are your end goals you hope to have at the end of that internship? Just be clear about what you're going in for, and making sure you can get get that at that location at that place. Um, and don't just look, okay, who's posting internship jobs and be passive and timid about it. This is something Jan Preston uh, needed to learn a little bit. Uh, go after, if it's, I want to be making work in San Francisco, I want to be making work in, in an exciting underground LA theater scene, uh, then go call, go write a letter, go make yourself known, because chances are, I can tell you, I'm, I'm speaking for the O'Neill, there are jobs and internships that uh, come up and we don't have time or we just didn't put it on the website yet. And it came up last week and someone called or someone knows someone. It's just make it, don't be afraid to raise your hand. It would be a lesson that I would Like so many things I want to respond to. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh -huh. So to the kind of the, the competency um, uh, skill set point, especially talking about 
uh, internships or first jobs or entry level jobs. Um, the one thing I wanted to add was um, I think, and I, I try and do this myself, but I think the best employers are looking for people with the competencies and the and the people who are stars and whether or not they have the skills, but they demonstrate a passion, desire, interest, intelligence. That is what we should be hiring for, particularly for, for those entry level positions. Sometimes, in particular, like short run jobs, um, people are often hiring for the skill set. I have a six week gig where I need someone to produce a thing. We may or may not be able to take the um, the the to, to indulge in the looking for the rock star, and because you have a you know like you have a, a limited time duration. But when you're talking about these other these other longer term jobs, that I think the best companies are the ones that are looking for uh, somebody who will grow. And like the 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 more scared you are of losing that person in two years, the more interesting they should be as a candidate for the job. Um, and the best thing you can do as a candidate is is keep that in mind. So if you're looking if you're looking at the right kind of company that is, takes that approach. Why, why are you interesting to them? Um, and the, the things that I, we read a lot of cover letters and resumes, and um, I have a lot of pet peeves around them, and a lot of people do. Like Michael and I have done a lot of this work together. Uh, one of the things that I always like to recommend is that if, find ways in which you're emphasizing your competencies, and but like other things that you have to take the time to do. Acknowledge that you know this company and why it's different from the other places that you're applying. Um, acknowledge not just why this is a great fit for you, but why you're a good fit for the company. If you walk into that with the same, any kind of approach with the same version of like, this is why this is so great for me and why I love you so much, I might not, I might not see in you as much of a, this growth potential and why you care about, like we want to know you care about us because we're all selfish human individuals and that's as important part of the exchange in that moment as it is saying why you are awesome. So, so that's just like a kind of general reminder that, that if, help us find you and it's not just about emphasizing those skills, it's about using your intelligence to indicate why you know this would be the right relationship. Um, so that goes to the point of like target the companies that you think are interesting, ask for information or interviews, put up Google alerts or um, one of my favorite websites when I, we always recommended to interns at Berkeley Rep, which I think still is pretty operational, was called changedetection.org. And it's you put in a, a URL into the website into the its function, and it, its bots will indicate if that if that piece of a website got changed with any substantive degree. So you can put in a job listing page on the companies that you're interested in, and you'll get an alert. It's a little bit more effective than a Google alert perhaps might be. So we would always tell interns like, if you know there are five companies you would die to work for, start hunting those sites, that particular page on that site now, and um, find out if there's any connection you have there. Uh, to the point of view of the the like internships are, uh, I only can't even say necessary evil, but like there there's parts about them that I find so problematic. It's also part of the way the industry works right now, so change is really hard. Um, at Woolley, a few years ago, we kind of discontinued the internship program, except for the pieces that always run well, which are the artistic internships. They're competitive. There's no doubt to me that those are um, educational experiences where connections are made and access is granted. Uh, we still accept interns in other departments, but I, until I can find a better way to do it or a better way to afford it, we're not kind of relaunching the internship program, um, except for when people approach us because they really have a desire and fit. Not everywhere can afford to do it. Some companies are built on their intern labor and, and are giving great access and valuable experience, but if it's not right for you, it's going to be a terrible way to spend six months or a year. The one caveat is the theater industry is still a little bit old-fashioned. I mean, many places are like this, but the networks are super important. So if an internship is a way to get you a net, into a network um, you know, to all of these points, that is how we end up hiring and, and uh, the kind of the way in which an internship or a mentorship or a fellowship gives people, um, future employers, a vote of confidence in you as an individual is pretty huge still in the way that we operate. We will see a familiar name on a resume or a familiar company and, and we will read that in a different way from someone who is equally qualified without those connections. That's just, that, that still is, a, a, I think, an operating force in the way that the theater industry works. I'll just punctuate that networks like I'll see networks and raise you just like relationships because um, I'm aware that that's not just undergrads in the room but graduate students too so maybe internships is not your jam um, and so just like you cannot underestimate the importance of relationship building in the field which is I think a slightly different slightly different than networks 
which is, you know, they go hand in hand, but um, I just am aware, so aware of, like, even just the three years that I had at the Yale School of Drama several years ago, how <laughs> like, <yes. laughs> those relationships that I built at, at the school are still operating today. They are still feeding my professional, um, uh, you know, acceleration, and they are, and I am sort of feeding it back into it. There's a kind of wonderful reciprocity, and when a relationship goes south, like you kind of never know who is going to be important in your future. So the best rule of thumb is like, don't be an asshole, and don't don't take for granted, you know, anyone because the relationship piece is like. It is just mission critical, and I'll just for the uh, certainly on the artistic side of, of the equation, relationships with artists are they are a producer's currency. Relationships are a producer's currency, but but relationships with artists like you can't produce without good relationships. Period. And so I'll 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 raise you one on that too. Is uh, you you cannot avoid. As soon as you have a relationship of any kind, it will follow you for the rest of your career, for good or for bad. Um, while there is a job application process, which seems very straightforward, particularly at the lower levels where you provide a cover letter, a resume, and some references, um, entry-level jobs for the most part, and, and junior staff, um, I don't feel like most theater companies have the time, bandwidth, capacity to reach further for reference calls than what you present as a candidate. Some places might for particularly important or competitive positions, but once you hit higher level jobs, like, did you work with Edgar? No, uh, was, Stephen Richard. With Stephen Richard. So like, even as long as you've been in your position, if then, and you interned at Arena for a summer, it's very possible that without your blessing, if you're applying for another job, Stephen will get a phone call. Absolutely. And, uh, and if Stephen said, I don't remember that guy, that's just as informative as you know, like you might give a pass, like it was an internship or something. But like, but like that, you learn something from that. And um, as much as like, oh, I, I love him, hire him. They will. F you don't have a choice anymore about the calls people will make mm -hmm. around networks they or relationships they think that you have. Um, because you know, uh, I, I probably we're doing an artistic director search at Willie right now. The part of the process that we're in right now with candidates is we just ask all of them, who would you prefer we not call? Which is a nice thing that not every search firm probably does. Um, our 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 group is. So that means we have the candidates did have a chance to say like, please don't call my current employer. I'm not telling them I'm up for the gig and it would be detrimental to my current space. Um, beyond that list of two or three names that I'm going to provide you and ask you kindly not to call, literally anyone in the universe is fair play. Like we could look at their resume and go, oh, I know this person I worked with four years ago. I'm just going to call. So like these are, it is not just your currency. It is also like, don't be an asshole. Like this is your, this, this will follow you around. In great ways, I think people still also get jobs that way. So if you can find your way into a network that is one you want to be in, it is an, it's a great access point for your future, future career. And I will follow this poker analogy <laughs> and go all in. <laughs> um, that your, your mentorship is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. and, the, and those are another, I think, level of relationships that you want to establish because you have so many resources here being here at Yale and so much access that as you are job searching, there's so many people around you who can be helpful to you. And it's also speaking about your alumni community. Um, you know, I, I refer to it as the Yale Mafia that is out there running theaters and programs everywhere. And I just don't think you can underutilize your network that you already have inherent in being in an institution um, to find an individual or a leader who has had the career maybe that you want or someone who just is admirable um, to seek that mentorship out. Um, especially as a young person, it is, it is all that is flattering, and, and, and to hear from young people who are like, "Hey, you've done this career, you've gone about this work. Can I learn from you, or is there anything that you know? Can we have a, a coffee or something like that?" And it, I, I found it very useful, um, even now in my career, just having that uh, that mentorship relationship. And people say yes, like even an informational interview or a coffee. Um, I mean, you know, aside from the, I'm very busy world reality uh, that so many people have, like people, you know, all, we'll try and say yes and make time. Um, 
because people like talking about themselves, they like helping the next generation of leaders. Any and you may hire them one day. Just the other thing, right, right. This, this uh, uh, field, it just it flips real quick. Totally. So, yeah. so don't don't let that be a reason you don't you don't ask for something. And if you if you hit a wall, uh, also don't be discouraged. A lot of it is is not uh, is not about you. Um, it's about um, Danny's ability to get into my schedule and find <laughs> to take phone calls with people, which I did. I think, like, I didn't really ditch anybody in the past the couple of years that you were there. But sometimes it took a month. So. I'll also say, just because no one said it, and I promised I wouldn't talk, but who cares? Uh, <laughs> so the Yale network is that's big. I mean, you have access to the alumni database. Call people up. You, I mean, they, you, you know who these people are. Um, but also, if you're traveling, um, think about what organizations are in the area and just get a coffee with somebody. I literally, my second job out of grad school happened because I had had coffee with Karen Wood at Laguna Playhouse two years previous and she happened to be looking for a general manager when I was looking for a job. We hit it off, she called, she called me up because she remembered me and I was ready to go and so that was kismet. Um, so I cannot emphasize enough, just make the outreach. Nobody's going to be mad at you for making the outreach, exactly. and it's so valuable. Um, I want to throw a little bomb into the into the internship thing um, because I again I have the straight line career all the way back to my internship at Goodman. I mean I didn't even know what the brand of Goodman was when I when I went when I went to the Goodman. I was too young and stupid. Um, I thought I wanted to be an artistic director, which was never the case. But I remember a League of Resident Theaters meeting, uh, which Kelvin referenced before, the seventy-four largest. Uh, producing theaters across the country. and Some of some, the largest. Some of the largest. Some of the largest. Um, Thank you. The most important ones. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, uh, there was a question that they, they asked the crowd, and they said, who, oh, was all the managing leaders of these theaters, who here did an unpaid internship? And 80% of the hands went up. So I throw that out there because the evidence is that the people, at least five years ago, when the question was asked who were leading the theaters, with sorts of people who had had internships, and what does that mean? What does that mean for people looking for for jobs? Uh, I, I just would put it to the group. It means uh, I, I it means that the people in the room who I know from uh, reports and experience, who are predominantly white and predominantly male, had the resources to do an unpaid internship. And that is part of how the system works, the system and the man. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's what that, that's all that means, is that there were people who could um, afford to do them and to take the time off or what have you and, and, and not work. It's not good. I, I, I had a paid internship, like I was paid, and it was three months long, and at the end of it, I got a job <laughs> that, that was full time, you know? And, um, and I think that for all of the reasons that we, we're describing, networks and relationships and, and what have you, internships can be incredibly valuable. And they are also inherently sort of like systemically oppressive and racist and 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 it's broken um, so I I feel like there's if you've got a choice between doing an internship for free if you can afford that that's great but I, I don't want to discount the like what it means to go and actually and like have a job mm -hmm. and work even if it's not in the theater. And um, I mean, some of my most important, I learned how to be a producer during the three years I was now working in the theater. And it was hands down the most formative and valuable time of my career to date. Um, so there's, I think that there's not, I don't think internships are the only path, I guess. I didn't have, I, I'm doing fine. I didn't have an internship. Uh, like I, I got a job working for Northwestern's uh, theater department, um, which paid like thirteen twenty-five an hour, uh, which for them was like a pretty decently high salary. I think it's probably like close to what work study is these days. Um, uh, I have no idea what it is. It's a little more. It's a little more. Good for good for you. Um, but that was so. That was what I was making in tw two thousand four, five, six. 
um, anywhere from like 20 hours to 100 hours a week because it was a flexible job depending on different programs. And I started a theater company and ran it in, in my free time. Um, so that was like my, that was my internship. So I was, I was paid, I learned a lot. Like there are, there are ways to navigate the system that don't require that. There are also internships out there that um, might do slightly, like there are some with housing. There are some with housing and a Metro card or $100 or like you can work in the box office and make more money. If, this, if you cannot afford to do an internship, there are a few out there that do that. Target them early, figure out how you get into it. Like that there, you know, like if you make the system work for you if, if you can, all can. The O'Neill, um, we use a lot of interns because we're, we, we have 30 people on year-round staff excluding faculty, but then we have 300 on payroll in the summer because we just balloon with our programming. So we need some help uh, in all departments, and so we do do internships, but we also have a campus, so we're able to house and feed as part of the program, and it's a two and a half month internship or thereabouts. So, um, yes, uh, we try to scholarship as many, and you know, underwrite everybody um, and provide the everything we can. We can still be better, but my point being, um, it's a limited. It's not a. Let me rephrase this. Go after things where you have an exit plan, where you know exactly where you, what your goals are going in, and how that you have a way out, and you're not going to be thirty thousand dollars in debt afterwards. Um, internships can be useful for the networking opportunities at a place like the O'Neill because there's three hundred people coming through and more uh, from all disciplines from all over the country. Uh, that can be useful at the lunch table. But is that is that something that you is it valuable to you, and why? Uh, at, just go in with an exit plan would be my advice. Well, I mean, and I mean, the thing you can say about the eighty percent of people who raise their hands because I, I sit in the room with these people all the time anyway, so they wouldn't mind my saying it. Um, they represent a traditional career path to the theater, mm -hmm. and that traditional career path privileges access. You know, and and that that's just a reality. Um, they were probably taking unpaid internships at a the early stages of the regional theater movement. You know, this right. is a, an industry that's been being created. Most of these theaters are celebrating 50 and 60th year anniversaries, and these people are leading institutions at this point. So it was a different time. I think the kind of manager that we will be facing for the next 20 years will have an entirely different trajectory. They will be coming out of school with MFAs. They will, will, will be trained and educated in different ways than, for instance, graduating college and just working in a box office and working your way up, which has happened to a lot of those managers. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be different. Folks will come in and they will be specialized in management and will, you know, sort of have that. Um, and we're in a whole different age of, of technology where folks can go out and be billionaires leaving college at college age. You know, it, it's different now. Um, and nonprofits are going to have to react at some point. Um, and I, I think the internship program will be assessed. Accordingly, I love uh, that you you made the transition for me. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> from that traditional path to making your own path, mm. and you know, um, Megan, you founded the theater company. I was a, Don't do I was it. part of founding a theater company. What are some ways? What are some ways? I mean, I, I I will field you know a call a month from some somebody in undergrad who once an MFA in theater management and they found my name on, on a website. And I always tell them, slow down, you're a sophomore in college, get a job, get a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whatever, and you know, try maybe try something out or try to make your own work. But I mean what what is your advice in that case? When somebody really wants to specialize really early on and how do they develop competencies, how do they get a taste for it, uh, maybe with beyond internships, beyond you know, blue sky thinking. Just give the party. Stop, stop waiting for the party to invite you, but make the party and invite everybody else. So in this, by this I mean like, okay, so invite a bunch of your friends you want to direct uh, and you're a sophomore in college, just all right, throw something together. Uh, you want to produce, uh, let's produce something in a church basement after college. Uh, let's just don't wait for permission. Just go give the party, I would say, and see if you have fun. See what and what parts of it you have fun with, and what parts are not as fun. 
I usually recommend a variety, getting a variety of experiences, especially if you're th interested in theater leadership on the artistic or management side. Part of, I mean, the jobs that we are doing right now have become so incredibly complex, and the expectations of theater leadership on either side is that you are a jack of all trades and understand equally well how to supervise all of the, you know, it's just, it's everything, and it's comprehensive, and it's insane the degree of the professionalism that's happening in the field in a way that is great for the organizations, but kind of a, uh, like the the burden of of being that um, that unicorn is is insane. So if, if early in your career you have an opportunity to work in a variety of fields, not only will you learn more about what you are drawn to, you will set yourself up better for more complex career path. I have a slinky in my office that um, is there to remind me of what of how I got to where I am and where I'm going, um, which is to say it is just, it's just not, it's like straight lines are not um, terribly common, I guess. And I feel super happy with my squiggly line and none of it was planned on the forefront. It was all me being like, somebody wants to offer me a job in fundraising. That sounds good. Somebody wants to offer me a job in marketing. That sounds good. And so on and so forth. It was like for so for the first, you know, ten years of my career, I was I, I, I was just going to what was interesting to me without a kind of like preconceived notion of what I needed to get to. And even now, you know, at the early part of my middle of my career, I still am sort of like, okay. Let me, the, the extent to which I can divorce myself from a need to get to that particular point is the extent to which I will continue to just acquire skills and relationships and experiences that are going to serve me at come what may, you know? Um, so that's, that's how I did it. Can I make a plug for fundraising? Sure. Great. Um, so, this is a totally a personal bias of mine, but especially at the leadership level, again, artistic or management, the way the world is currently trending is there is a big expectation with a, to, for that people have a facility with fundraising. Um, and whatever that means. That could, like, but it for the most mean, part means like external relationships of some kind. So like even as an artistic program leader within the public, and uh, whether or not you're an introvert or an extrovert, for example, like you still have to, you still have to interface with, um, with, with not just theater people in order to make the organizations work in the, in the current environment. I raise, raise money. money. Yes. We all, <laughs> we all, uh, you know, there are some aspects of theater, of, of, of theater jobs that don't impact this, but the extent to which you can find a way to be comfortable with that, I think that, it, that, that speaks to a longer term higher level career trajectory. So like, just, you know, like figure it out. Find your way to expose yourself to ways in which you can uh, take a public speaking class. Our literary director is doing a, like, a, uh, like a toast maker class, which is, uh, you know, just to be comfortable with, with speaking in public. Um, uh, which is, there are all sorts of different aspects in terms of how we interface with people that don't even necessarily mean asking someone for a gift. But you have to find a way to be comfortable with that if the, in the way that the world is going. That is where increasingly more and more, if not more than 50% of our income is coming from. So. Which is a lot about just, um, relationship building and, and storytelling. Mm -hmm. like so, so much, whether it's fundraising or um, dramaturgy or marketing, it's still, or executive leadership, so much of this is just about knowing how to tell a story and being able to tell the right kind of story in the right moment, um, knowing your audience. And, and so that's good news. Because we are, that's what we do. And, and Kelvin brought us to the mission earlier on, thank, thank you for mentioning that something should exist in that space. A lot of this fundraising and storytelling is being able to articulate the mission or your relationship to it. So you shouldn't work for anywhere as a nonprofit if you can't do one of those two things. And the better that you, you are at it at any level of your job, the better you will be at your job. And that's, again, a, like a personal bias. But don't, this is also where we say, don't work in nonprofit theater if you're doing it for the money. <laughs> You're doing it, hopefully, like you're doing it for the, the mission. Like you, you want it, you're doing it because there's some kind of change or, or, or effect on the audience or the universe that you want to have. There are other ways 
you can make money doing this work, but there are other ways to make money faster if you would like that to be your goal. So if you don't have a relationship to the mission of the companies you're working for, you're just not going to be happy. Yeah, and I, I think that that's one thing I would advise, especially as you're or going on your interviews, is to know the mission going in, so that if someone asks you during the interview, what do you think of our mission? You should know it. Um, you know, and, and sometimes they're very vague statements and they're very broad awesome. and generalized, but at least know what it is, so that you know that your personal values kind of align with that. And in, in terms of going your own way, there's also professional development tools you can use. There are programs like TCG that give you these experiences, even if you're in a job that isn't giving you that or feeding your soul in that way. Um, they also engage you in a cohort of other leaders around the country who are also seeking similar ends. And I think that was the biggest turning point for me was finding other people who were interested in management um, and people of color also who were doing the same work and will be going through the same trajectory was, was an, a very eye-opening experience. So even if you're not getting the training you want at your work, I challenge you to find the outlets to learn about development and fundraising, even if you don't do it on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, and, and do that relationship building outside for yourself, because there are a number of resources out there for you to take advantage of, and TCG is just one of them. I do want to, um, I'm going to leave enough time for questions, yep. but maybe if everybody wants to just take 30 seconds here at the end, say anything you want to say that you haven't gotten to say. Stephanie, you were about to say something. So I was just, 30 seconds. It, it will take less than that. Great. Finding your people is huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Finding your people and finding your tribe, your professional tribe is massive. Mm -hmm. well, just find, find the joy in your work. I mean, given the current climate of the world we are living in, um, it, it's hard. So finding that passion and that attachment to your work is crucial. Even if you're just, if you're on the management side and still engage with the art and love the art, find that joy in your work if you can. Um, I would, I would, I mean, I would just say like, good job for being here. You know, you're, you're, by seeking out resources like this or asking questions, not to say that we are the most expert panel that you could see in, in your lifetime or in your time at Yale, but like, Going to these things is something that, we, even if what you learn from it is like, that's not my pathway, that's a great thing to learn by going to a thing. So, so uh, I just encourage and applaud that instinct in yourself. Also, this is not some secret uh, Wizard of Oz situation. You, can, you all can absolutely do this. This is, uh, I mean, I'll, what did I know coming into the O'Neill? Uh, you, this is, Smart people can is and passionate people, which all of you are here by being so. You already have that innately. I was terrified of fundraising, and I had to do it almost immediately. Uh, and it's storytelling, and it's being passionate about your mission, and it's and then suddenly it's easy, and you're just talking about because the, the the donors just want to hang out with you. Ultimately, at the end of the day, they want to be around the art, and you're the cool one. They want to be hanging out with you. You can do this. You're the cool one. Cool. Uh, any, anybody have any, any questions for any of the panelists or all of the panelists? No questions. And too Sam basic. Linden never comes to a thing without a question. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, how helpful was your major in economics? How helpful is it? Yeah. Uh, reasonably. Uh, it helps me really understand a, budget, a balance sheet and when we're doing you know, our audits and all that and the budgets generally on uh, knowing the questions to ask. Um, also it's helped me in fundraising to talk to the folks in Wall Street and understand that you know okay the Fed is going to change interest rates next week and what does that mean for their portfolio and, my, and we can, I can have a, I am not the most expert in the field but I can have a conversation with the folks who are experts in the field. And that has been, and then they feel a little more comfortable, perhaps, uh, with that I know what they do, and so that they then want to be a little more helpful to do the work that I do. So yes, it has been helpful in understanding both the mechanics of the O'Neill, but also uh, in my relationships with donors. I have a highly specific question for Ms. Pressman. No. Uh, that <laughs> website you talked about that was like better than Google Alert. Yeah. What was the name of that? Change detection. Change detection. <laughs> dot or I think it's an org, but you would find it if you looked at it. 
look for it if you Google it. It might be change detector. Change detector? I think it's detection. But you'd find it. Yeah. And I'll put, I plus one that. I still, I mean, I still use it, and I, I put up like competitor sites in there, so I know when they're announcing seasons or um, like posting jobs. Hi, I, I guess I'm just curious uh, to hear your perspective on the future of the American theater. Um, <laughs> just, there's been a little bit of a conversation just about like these organizations that came from a time uh, yeah. that is very different from the time we live in now. Uh, for those of you that are leading these organizations, you know, what are you thinking about in terms of where uh, you're driving your organizations uh, to really be the theaters of the future and what that looks like? All right, no opinions, probably. I think you're looking at the future of the American yeah. theater. <laughs> That's, the oh, That's a better answer, because I was trying to hide in my scarf. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I think it's an incredibly exciting time. This is a good, uh, these conversations and the change we are experiencing is painful, but it's also incredibly exciting. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, let's just call spade a spade, the leadership in American theater has been entrenched for decades for most of the, for the most part. Most of the major theaters have leadership that has been there for a long time. Uh, whereas when they, they themselves took that leadership, the people before them had it for a much shorter time. So that has been frustrating to many generations below them as they try to, as they bump up against the ceiling that they can't get further on and then they can't get further on. Et cetera, et cetera. I'm just talking like young boomers haven't so, gotten a chance to break through. Exactly. Because yeah. there are still plenty of people who are octogenarians. And God bless them, they, they help the field, they change the field. I'm not trying to necessarily, it's just. We don't have pension plans, exactly. so it's really hard to retire. It's like actually another equally like That's other end of the spectrum it, field problem. So now that there is change happening, it's the, that there is transition happening at many of these theaters and more is coming. Uh, it's a great way, it's a great breath of fresh air across the industry, I think, across and, the field. And yet, it is still sort of deeply entrenched, and yes. I'll just always be that person to say this, but it's still super deeply entrenched in all of the, um, the sort of racist systems that America is entrenched in. So you, we are still, even as the leadership is changing over, seeing a, a, a homogenized set of leaders at the top of the institutions and um, and unless we can figure out how to uh, dehomogenize ourselves and sort of examine ourselves deeply in the ways that we are perpetuating um, to our own detriment perpetuating these sort of cycles of exclusion and systems of exclusion not just in our leadership structures but also in our storytelling in the form of our storytelling all of it, it requires um, a re some real so soul searching, um, or or we'll render ourselves irrelevant, like many institutions have, and they're going to die a slow death, and so be it. Well, and I, I would I'm going to say Yahtzee. Uh, <laughs> also, uh, poker not a Yahtzee. The, the other piece of it's the board leadership, but the board comes out of the audience. And if your space is not inclusive, and if your work is not inclusive, um, the audience will remain as it has been for, in, in the case of my organization, 87 years. Um, and you know, you have, uh, you know, you have majority white communities that are surrounded by communities of color, and yet the doors are not open for the audiences to participate in the work uh, because they're exclusionary spaces. So I would just say all of that, and it also needs to come from the bottom and we need to be spending the money and the resources that it will take to open the doors. It's going to be very expensive um, to get younger audiences, to get audiences of color because we've spent so much time building those barriers. You know, I, I think we've learned a valuable lesson in this past year with, after the election about the consequences of uh, excluding certain communities from certain conversations. And, and what I mean is, is you know, someone brought up to my attention, they're like, do you know any Trump supporters? And I said, I don't really. And, and some people just say, well, I don't want to know them. And I was like, well, but they just influence an entire election and you don't know these people. I think there, there's something to learn in that. 
And I think a lot of our regional theater institutions privilege certain audiences, and they have for decades. And I think they're going to run up against a sustainability issue very quickly um, when that audience starts to die out or the new audiences and the new generations find other means of entertainment, of engagement with their communities, which is what our institutions are supposed to be doing. So I hope that the reaction to that need and that necessity looks like a more diverse community of leadership, but also in uh, new ways of our theaters engaging in our communities. That is not just come in, pay your ticket price, sit down, watch a proscenium set, and go home. I really do hope that we really emphasize community, and when I put it in air quotes, is greater good. Um, how about good? Like, let's do more good and, and, and find our ways into, into conversations we haven't been a part of. And that's really only going to change once the old guard steps down and new leaders, like the ones who are sitting on to my right and my left, are going to start challenging the notion of what it means to work in an institution. That's what I'm excited about, and that's why I'm here. I mean, there will be, there will be live performance in our society and our culture moving forward. I have no doubt about that, and people will continue to gather despite technology's attempt to make us all sit alone at our <coughs> home on our phones. Uh, but my, my hope for the, for, the, for the theater is that we are still relevant in, in what, however that journey evolves, and I do think a lot of that has to do with uh, the way in which we engage our community, the way in which people are part of their own uh, curation or creation of work, and the ways in which we are evolving the art form. Um, it, it feels like it's been static for, I mean, it feels like it's like established, but the point is, is that it, it, and it, it's been a little static for a while, and this is an art form that's changed dramatically over time. Um, and uh, just because there's been a current kind of institutionalization of theaters doesn't mean that we're not ready for another kind of way in which we evolve the way our art works. Uh, we had our, our holiday show right now is um, um, a blend of, um, uh, it's kind of uh, got an arc and a narrative and, and performance and play and like it kind of got some theatrical scenes but it's also sketch comedy and stand up and for the, f for the first time in a long time I sat in the theater and a lot of the audience was snapping back to the performers, particularly the stand up sections because it was like a direct, like, like it was stand up, it was like directly uh, speaking to the crowd and there was like a whole set of people snapping back and on opening night one of the older white donors said to me like We're, why are people snapping? I found it very distracting. I feel like that's not appropriate for the theater and I was like no <laughs> um, But it was like to me this whole thing of like she had an established point of view of what what was appropriate in the theater and like I shared the story with my friend who worked for a Shakespeare theater company who had a similar feeling about like the way in which I mean you probably feel this about like mobile Shakespeare like people who have this feeling about like Shakespeare's the most holy uh, we have to be quiet and respectful when that was written for a crowd of people who were like barely paying attention half the time and talking back to the like we just we have just created this fictionalized structure around what is theater that we're about to get out of. So I think I think we're we're there. Okay. And just to say artistically, I I feel very like that thing the the sort of formal mashup of like what we know as plays mm -hmm. and what we see as music or these other sort of artistic disciplines. I, I feel wholly and concretely in my soul, and I see it in the world, that that, that mashup is artistically where the field is going. It is not, we're not going to silo the storytelling mediums anymore. They are, they are, they are, they are mixing and mingling as we, mm -hmm. as we should have, as we all should be, but um, that, that is the, I think that's why I'm still in the theater, actually, because there's so many reasons to get out. But when I look at what art is coming down the 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 pike and the and the form of it in particular, um, it's just it's. I think it's going to break all of those tacit rules of engagement that we have that a play requires. It's really exciting. Big stuff. Uh, may, may I ask a question? I, when was the last time anything you produced had people in the audience talking back to the stage, shouting, that's bullshit, or, yeah, or boo? Can I be completely serious? Camelot. 
Well, because, <laughs> because, because we had the most diverse audiences in it, Westport Country Playhouse that we've had in, apparently in memory because it was a show people actually wanted to see. And so they showed up and we did some price discrimination and people, and we, and we did, and we did uh, race blind, ca not race blind, casting, race conscious casting. Um, and it was and it was a big hit, and so the audiences were full, and they were full of many different people, and pe a lot of people that didn't come to the theater often, and they told Guinevere not to go with him. <laughs> <laughs> I, work, I work at the public theater, so it happened all the time. All the but for, but one of so it happened in the summer. The summer was really Caesar, but it happens actually on the regular with the program I run called the Mobile Unit that that Megan was alluding to, which is Shakespeare to. Um, community centers, prisons, homeless shelters, libraries, and then ultimately back home at the public. And it, it and our Shakespeare scholar in residence, uh, Jim Shapiro, who is by all, many accounts one of the top five in the world, is like he's such a junkie of the program because he's like this is what it must have been like back in Shakespeare's day, because they will. They are talking back to the audience. Well, a soliloquy is no longer just like musing inside of one's head. It's actually, you're actually engaging with the audience. So it actually, it, it, it makes the art better because it is what the art was actually intended to do. And it, um, it makes the experience more joyful across the board. And it elevates the skills of our, of our actors exponentially. Every single one of the actors comes out the other side of that a different and better actor because they have to be more present than they ever had to be before because they will talk, because the audience will talk back, which is amazing. Our first show of the season was a play called The Arsonists, which is um, also known as The Firebugs. It's uh, a 1950s play by a German playwright. We had a modern translation um, that was done by a British guy about t like eight or nine years ago and then a, a, an Americanization of it that was just for our production. And I don't believe there's been an Americanization of it on a like, professional theater level for a while. And it's about like, you know, uh, fire starters basically who move into a community and regular and like basically talk their way into your home and then after they've earned your trust, burn your house down. Um, and the lead character who's the, supposed to be the kind of like the model of society who's the hospitable, like he's like the person who, who you're like, I'm sympathetic with you because I also would have invited them in because I want to be seen as a good person. Um, as he starts to kind of self-destruct later at the end, talks to directly to the audience and asks some questions like, "What would you have done? When would you have? When would you have known?" And it's supposed to be a hard. I think like there's. I think it's not surprising when the audience talks back, but I think it's supposed to be a harder question to ask. Um, like people are supposed to be a little confused with like, "I get it. I would have done that too. I don't know." Um, almost every time, because I think of the direction of this production, people were like, the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and like did not, get, like gave him a total, like it was not, I don't feel like that's how that moment was, it was intended to go. <laughs> but almost every night there'd be someone who'd be like, what, dude, um, like what, like there's, I am, I am not you, like how to, and so every night we got it, not quite the expected response. This is a, 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 an after the play discussion. No, this is in the show. Oh, okay. In the show, the, the, the one time they break, the theater, <laughs> <laughs> they break, they break the fourth wall at one time in the show when he turns to the audience and says, what would you have done? And I do, it's supposed, it's written as a like conundrum. And most of the time the audience was like, I would have not let them in because <laughs> that dude was really large and scary and I have no, like, it was directed a little bit aggressively, I think. So we got really honest, honest responses from the audience who were, especially there's always some people at that moment who did not like what was happening. So I'll, I'll say in, it, they were more responses in the affirmative. Um, so they weren't like saying that's bullshit or anything like that. But um, we, when I was in Seattle, we did a production called Black Nativity mm -hmm. and it's presented as a non-denominational uh, sort of celebration experience of the holidays and also the, the biblical story so they do it in sort of with a gospel choir and pe and I mean people in the aisles standing up and singing and I mean just getting moved because they're dancers on the stage and, and you know and and just hearing some of the, the gospel music and especially with the holiday time, time and Christmas theme I mean it just had everyone up and there were amen corners all over the, the, the house and it's just riveting to go in a theater and, and experience that. But I'll also plug that when you go to a student matinee, mm. it's an entirely yes. different yep. experience seeing right. a play. So, yes. because watching such an honest response to everything, <laughs> students are just emotive and vocal, and they're always the most entertaining. And I love like sneaking out of the office and going to watch a student audience watch a play. 
Um, it's one of the most gratifying. I was thinking more of the, sort of the institutional theater, where the polite white audience like myself goes. And I see a lot of crap in that <laughs> environment. And nobody seems to, everyone says, oh, wow, this must be really good theater, because I didn't understand a word. <laughs> Our audience tells us, even our, our most polite, widest audience will tell us after the show if they don't like it. But we've created a culture around having a dialogue around artistic risk-taking and experimentation so that people can come up to us afterwards and say, I, uh, the best case version of that conversation is they say, I totally get what, why you took this risk. I don't necessarily know what, like they don't always necessarily know why or how, but they will feel very comfortable saying, it was not for me, I thought, I thought you didn't get there, or that sucked, but like, the best, so the best version for that from a programming point of view is they're still like, I appreciate why you, why you, what you were trying to do, but like, wow, failure. And that's a, <laughs> that's a, like, we, we actually cultivate that in our audience because as a company that takes risks with every single production we do, if they're not comfortable having that conversation with us, they will leave. But it's what Kelvin said, is that the audience you're describing, this is, this is my subscription bread and butter, um, this is not a sustainable model. This is not an audience that, one, fills the house now, or, and two, in 10 years, will certainly not fill the house. So you've got to be talking to other audiences. You've got to be bringing in, you know, I mean, we just described like eight different audiences that will fill the house and maybe fill it in a slightly more interesting way for even the people around them. So uh, that's, that's the, to your question, that's, that's the existential issue. If you want to perpetuate, if you want, if you want to uh, per, uh, perpetuate an institution, which I think actually should be an open question, but if that's a, if that's an aspiration, that's a solution. It also happens at the O'Neill plenty of times. Uh, the work is so raw in both senses that it's so embryonic and also raw in subject matter often uh, that there will be reactions in the audience. Uh, and then beyond that, I mean, we have. It's a campus if you haven't been up to the O'Neill. So there's a pub afterwards. And so it's always a hotbed of discussion afterwards, mm. yes. And that's what I wanted to see more of. It's that you don't just go see a piece of theater and go home. And, and there's no guarantee that you're supposed to like everything in a season. But having the opportunity to engage and debate with other audience members, I think, would be exciting um, for me to, to actually talk with someone. Well, it's like, I didn't get this. but. Someone is like, this changed my life, you know? And to have that spectrum of, I think that's what we should be open to, is that not everyone would love everything that we program or get everything, every director's vision, but how do we talk about that and how do we engage our community to be responsive theater goers? Um, that's just something that I've, I've been trained to do, you know, to say it's, it's not for me, you know, rather than I think that's crap. It's, you know, why isn't it about that? And I wish we had more conversations just like that one. Yeah, there's three minutes. Everybody wants to ask one more question, unless you're super hungry, in which case there's pizza. It smells so good. It does smell good. <laughs> All right, well, I want to thank the panel uh, today. I think they've done a great job. Thank you. Thank you.